The southern polar regions are a forbidding place. Antarctica's harsh climate and thick ice coverage have made archaeological explorations, or explorations of any kind, exceptionally challenging. This has added a sense of mystery to various theories that humans could once have occupied the continent as a permanent civilization. To me, the obvious answer is we are dealing with the fingerprints of a lost civilization that mapped the world and that left evidence of that mapping. Graham Hancock's Antarctic Civilization Hypothesis presents a bold and controversial theory that challenges conventional views on human history. At its core, Hancock proposes that an advanced civilization existed in Antarctica thousands of years ago, predating known ancient civilizations like Egypt and Sumeria. This hypothesis draws upon various pieces of evidence, ranging from geological anomalies to ancient maps and myths, to suggest that humanity's past is far more complex and mysterious than typically acknowledged. One key aspect of Hancock's hypothesis revolves around the Pyrie Race map, a famous 16th century map that depicts Antarctica with a level of accuracy that seems impossible given the historical context. Drawn by the eponymous Ottoman sailor and cartographer in 1513, this map illustrates a relatively accurate coastline of South America. It also hints at the presence of a landmass where Antarctica is, albeit one with no ice. The outline of the supposed Antarctic depiction more closely resembles the physical land of the Antarctic continent than it does the ice pack, which stretches out into the ocean beyond the land. So, if Piri Race did manage to make it that far south, he should have drawn the outline of Antarctic ice, not the land. Unless, of course, he had some special knowledge that others lacked. In addition to an unfrozen Antarctica, the map features other details that, according to Hancock, have led some minds to speculate that Piri Reese's cartographic knowledge must have been derived from even earlier maps or documents now lost to time, created by some unknown but highly advanced civilization who explored the world long before our recorded history. These earlier people must have visited and possibly inhabited Antarctica before it froze over. Proof that Antarctica was once populated. Furthermore, Hancock points to geological evidence suggesting that Antarctica may have once been ice-free and habitable. Homo sapiens line descends from a line that goes back about six million years, not much further than that, if we accept conventional evolutionary theory. So six million years ago, Antarctica is supposed to have been as cold and as frozen as it is today. And there's, no, there's undoubtedly a time, they found fossils on Antarctica, there's undoubtedly a time when, when Antarctica was, was lush and green. The question is, was it lush and green during the lifetime of the human species? Yes. Geological surveys have revealed anomalies such as ancient river valleys and mountain ranges buried beneath the ice, indicating that Antarctica's climate was drastically different in the distant past. Hancock suggests that this more hospitable environment could have supported a thriving civilization, perhaps one that possessed advanced technologies and knowledge now lost to history. Supporting his hypothesis, Hancock also highlights ancient myths and legends from cultures around the world that reference a lost civilization or a great flood. He argues that these myths could be distorted memories of real events such as the cataclysmic end of an Antarctic civilization due to rising sea levels as the Ice Age ended. By examining similarities between these myths and incorporating them into his theory, Hancock builds a narrative of a forgotten chapter in human history that challenges mainstream archaeological interpretations. But Hancock speaking the truth, or he's only an eccentric man with an incredibly vivid imagination? What lies beneath kilometers thick slabs of ice in Antarctic? Is there any evidence of an alien or lost civilization frozen in time? Join us as we embark on a journey through time with ancient structures in Antarctica, exploring the enigmatic remnants of ancient civilizations and the mysteries that continue to puzzle archaeologists and historians. Ever since we humans discovered Antarctica, we have been getting entangled in its mysteries. This icy continent is spread over an area of about 1,360,000 square kilometers. 
That is, four countries like India can fit in it. Antarctica is the world's least explored continent so far, and we all know the reason for that. Yes, the extreme conditions here. If all the ice in the whole world, on the mountains or in large glaciers, is collected, then it makes up only 10% of Antarctica's ice. From this, you can guess how big the ice sheets in Antarctica are. For the last millions of years, ice has been continuously accumulating here, whose depth, which is great in places, is about four, seven kilometers. That is, five Burj Khalifas can be erected directly inside the ice of Antarctica. And even after that, a lot of space will be left. In the last many years of research, many secrets hidden inside this ice have been revealed. This land of everlasting mystery, as Antarctica's most famous explorer, Admiral Byrd, calls it, is teeming with recent surprises and discoveries. The key to Earth's past, present, and future all intersect on the fifth largest continent the size of the United States. Google Earth photographs have revealed two large openings at the surface that some say lead to underground tunnels and subglacial rivers flowing in an environment supporting temperatures of 15 to 21 degrees Celsius. The verdict is still out on whether this subglacial aquifer system was formed naturally or whether a human footprint inside these expansive inner chambers and underground caverns reveal a vast, comprehensive network of tunnels, military bases, possible cities, or even extraterrestrial UFO bases. Fueling the latter theory, in 2012, another strange anomaly was found on Google Earth of an odd 14.5-mile-long, 4.5-mile-wide structure that appears to either be a monster-sized UFO lodged under the ice or a secret camouflaged research station. Russian UFO researcher Valentin Degterev found in 2015 yet another strange image on the February 2012 Google Earth that appears to be four tanks covered in snow lined up facing what could be a crashed 204 feet wide and 40 feet tall UFO. Not only that, the satellite in 2016 captured a very surprising scene in Antarctica. A pyramid-like structure was seen emerging here from inside the melting ice. This photo sparked a new debate among geologists. Its four sides look the same, like the pyramids of Egypt, and one side is two kilometers wide. For reference, let us tell you that the size of Giza's largest pyramid is only 750 feet, or 220 meters. There is a lot of chance that these are not natural formations, but pyramids made by a civilization. If they have really been built by someone, then it is also possible that there can be many more pyramids in such a large area of Antarctica, where the secrets related to them can be buried inside the ice. Now, if we accept this theory as true for a second, then many questions arise in our minds. Who were those people? And how did they do this work in such a cold winter? Yes, it's true that ice core drilling is here. Millions of year old ice samples have also been found, which proves that millions of years ago, there was similar ice here in which life was not possible. But in 2017, a team of German geologists did core drilling at many places, and the result that came out was really surprising. The core drilling also brought out samples of thousands of year old herbs and trees which are buried under thousands of feet of snow. These were similar to the trees found in a rainforest. According to estimates from the institutes about 11,000 years ago, at the time of the last ice age, the whole of Antarctica was not covered with ice, but there were some areas where forests were found and life was possible. The question is, in this photo, is this a visible pyramid or not? No one could physically go and check it out there, but one thing became clear. There was a time when Antarctica was also green and full of life. Indeed, a long, long time ago, as much as 50 million years ago, palm trees similar to those that grow in modern Indonesia lined the coast of Antarctica, our southernmost continent and site of the South Pole. Inland, the forests were full of beech trees, like modern New Zealand or Patagonia. 
The plants in Antarctica survived for six months of the year in darkness during the long polar winter and six months of sunlight during summer. Antarctica today looks very different, covered in huge amounts of ice with some rocks, but no vegetation. So how did a lush green land change into a frozen continent? And how do scientists find out what Antarctica looked like in the past? When explorers first started to investigate the rocks of Antarctica, they found clues of a warmer past. An expedition in the early 1900s, led by Robert Falcon Scott, collected rock samples of 250 million-year-old fossil leaves as they attempted to be the first people to reach the South Pole. Fossils are ancient remains of life that can be preserved in rocks. Unfortunately, due to the harsh weather, they died trying to return to their boats at the coast. The important rocks with the ancient leaf fossils were found alongside their bodies. Throughout the 1900s, geologists discovered more and more plant and animal fossils in rocks and outcrops scattered around the small patches of Antarctica that are not covered in ice. These discoveries showed that plant life once thrived on the continent, but our understanding of how and when the climate changed, there did not start to be pieced together until analysis of the seafloor near Antarctica in the 1970s. We can get information about the past climate by using drill rigs to drill sediment cores, which we can study in laboratories. Sediment cores are a bit like time capsules. Sediments such as soil, mud, sand, and rocks are eroded off the land and transported by natural process like wind, rivers, and glaciers. These sediments are deposited in places like the seafloor or lake beds, where they build up layer by layer. We can drill down through these layers and pull out a long cylinder of material called a core, in which the sediments get increasingly older as we get deeper. This core can provide us with a huge amount of information about what the environment was like in the past. Paleoclimatologists, scientists who study the past climate, use three types of information to understand what Antarctica was like long ago. Ice cores, which contain annual layers of snow deposited on Antarctica, can provide very detailed climate records, but they only cover the more recent past, approximately the last one million years. Exposed rock outcrops on land can give us snapshots of the past, while sediment cores give a more continuous record, going back many tens of millions of years. The type of sediment found in a sediment core shows what happened at the core site in the past. For instance, ice sheets carry a messy mix of rocks, sand, and mud at their base, and they leave this material behind in rubble-like layers known as diamicts. Fossils in these sediments, like plant pollen, remains of ocean plankton, or chemical compounds that once formed the waxy coating on leaves, can be used to build a more detailed picture of the environment telling us about which plants and animals were present, what the temperatures were, or how wet or dry the climate was. When scientists started to collect sediment cores from around Antarctica, they noticed a big change about 34 million years ago. Before this, the sediments and fossils suggested a mostly ice-free, warm landscape with a wide variety of plant life. But 34 million years ago, evidence of ice started to appear. Drop stones, small rocks sitting in the seafloor mud, indicated the presence of icebergs floating in the water above. Changes in fossils showed a cooling climate and plant life became more tundra-like, similar to Arctic landscapes of northern Canada or Russia today. In some cores close to the continent, diamicts started to appear. All this was evidence for the first appearance of large, continent-wide ice sheets covering Antarctica at a time known as the Eocene-Oligocene boundary. The Antarctic climate continued to slowly cool over the last 34 million years, eventually becoming the icy, plant-free place we know today. This cooling was caused by decreasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Earth's carbon is split between separate parts of the environment, the atmosphere, the oceans, the biosphere, vegetation, and sediments. 50 million years ago, more carbon was stored in the atmosphere, 
causing the warm, greenhouse-like temperatures that led forests to grow in Antarctica. Since that time, several important environmental processes have played a role in transferring carbon from the atmosphere into sediments at the bottom of the ocean, cooling the global climate. The surface of the Earth is cracked into huge pieces called tectonic plates. Over time, tectonic plates move, changing ocean currents, building mountains in places like the Himalaya and changing the shapes of continents. Movement of tectonic plates around Antarctica pushed away Australia and South America, which isolated Antarctica and led to the development of the Southern Ocean and the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is a fast-flowing ocean current going all the way around Antarctica. This very big, windy area of ocean around Antarctica takes a huge amount of carbon out of the atmosphere, partly because carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater and partly due to little ocean creatures that use carbon to grow and build shells. When these organisms die, their shells sink into the sediment at the bottom at the ocean, locking carbon away. Other natural processes can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and lock it away too. For example, rocks containing certain minerals can react with carbon dioxide as they are eroded, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and transporting it through rivers into the ocean and deep ocean sediments. The climate of Antarctica has generally cooled over the last 50 million years, but on shorter timescales, there has been lots of variation. You might know our most recent glacial 18,000 years ago as the last ice age. These cycles are caused by changes in the orbit of the Earth, which changes the amount of sun and heat reaching the polar regions. This happens in a periodic way, with glacials occurring every 100,000 or 40,000 years depending on Earth's exact orbit. These cycles also happened many millions of years ago, as shown by repeating changes in layers of sediment in drill cores. Cores in the Ross Sea offshore Antarctica often show a layer of diamict, followed by sands and mudstones with occasional dropstones. This represents a change in the environment from an ice sheet, the diamict, to a floating ice shelf. When the ice shelf melts and only the ocean sits above the core site, the sediments become full of fossils of tiny plants and animals that were living in the ocean. This collection of sediment layers is usually repeated over and over again in these cores as the ice sheet grew and shrank through glacial and interglacial cycles. Scientists raid these sediment layers like pages of a book telling the story of how the Antarctic ice sheet has changed in the past. Back to Graham Hancock's theories about an ancient civilization in Antarctica. Although the idea is extremely appealing, but to be honest, up to now, there is no solid evidence about it at all. Regardless, Antarctic anomalies has fueled speculation about hidden gateways to hollow earth. The hollow earth theory is a concept that has captivated the imaginations of many for centuries. According to this theory, the Earth is not a solid sphere, but rather contains vast hollow spaces within it. Proponents of this theory claim that these hollow spaces are inhabited by advanced civilizations and may even contain hidden entrances at the North and South Poles. While the majority of the scientific community dismisses the hollow Earth theory as pseudoscience, a small number of believers argue that there is evidence to support its validity. The origins of the hollow earth theory can be traced back to ancient civilizations such as the Greeks and the Hindus who believed in subterranean realms beneath the earth's surface. These beliefs were often intertwined with religious and mythological ideas, making it difficult to separate fact from fiction. However, it was not until the 17th century that the hollow earth theory gained prominence in Western scientific thought. One of the earliest proponents of the hollow earth theory was Edmund Halley, the famous English astronomer and mathematician. Halley proposed that the earth was composed of several concentric spheres, with the outermost layer being solid and the innermost layer containing the hollow spaces. He argued that these hollow spaces could explain anomalies in earth's magnetic field and the variations in the length of days and nights at different latitudes. While Halley's ideas were groundbreaking for his time, 
they lacked substantial evidence and were largely speculative. In the 19th century, the hollow earth theory gained further traction through the works of John Cleves Sims Jr., an American army officer. According to Simmies, people live on the inside of the earth's crust rather than on its surface. He also suggests that there might be two openings at the poles, the North and South Poles, through which light enters from an inner sun, similar to what we see when looking into a bowl that reflects sunlight from its bottom surface. Sim has believed that this inner sun was much larger than the Earth's core. On June 13, 2014, scientists researching the Earth's mantle announced that they have found what they believe to be a vast body of water, three times the volume of all our oceans combined contained within a mineral layer 400 miles inside the Earth. The discovery shakes the foundation of what scientists and scholars thought they knew about the ground under our feet. We have just scratched the surface of the Earth. We drilled down eight miles, and we had to stop because it got too hot out of 4,000 miles to the core of the Earth. We went down to eight. Scientists can tell you more about the surface of the moon than the surface underneath our oceans. Since we have not drilled down far enough to confirm these findings, could it be that we may be wrong about the composition of our Earth? Is it possible that other Earths can be found within the confines of our planet? Historically, underground realms were not relegated to mere mythology. Well, Respected scientists and mathematicians have long guessed about a theory that became known as the Theory of Hollow Earth. The science is Edmund Halley's A.S., most famous for Halley's Comet. He was also extremely interested in the Earth. One of the challenges is trying to figure out what was the real structure of the inside of the Earth. Not only did he have a fascinating theory about the hollow Earth, but also that of multiple layers. 75 years later, 18th century mathematician Leon Hart Boiler put forth his own hollow earth theory with no concentric shells and the sun at the center, which spans over 600 miles. Euler was a gifted mathematician who developed his idea that the planet earth is not only hollow. Instead, the poles are thinned and they are introduced into the inner core at the north and south poles of the earth. He imagined that advanced civilizations were living inside the planet. Hollow Earth will be relisted two centuries later in 1947, when famous polar explorer Admiral Richard Byrd flew reconnaissance missions over the North Pole. Admiral Byrd reported in his private journal about a mysterious land beyond the North Pole, which he called the center of the great unknown. Admiral Richard Byrd was able to fly to the North Pole and back and was recorded flying over the lush green area where none should have been. And then three years later, he flew over the South Pole. When Admiral Byrd's task force got to Antarctica, one of the first things they discovered was an entrance into a hollow Earth civilization. On this inner Earth, they discovered that it was inhabited by very advanced beings, the Admiral made a lot of unusual statements, including talking about what he called a new kind of craft that could fly from pole to pole. When Byrd got back to the United States, he was brought back to Washington. There, he was questioned very heavily about his day, and allegedly he was told to stop talking about this. Beside Admiral Byrd, former Colonel Billy Woodard also has some claim about the hollow earth. A couple of years ago, Billy Fay Woodard shared his experience while assigned to the infamously top-secret Area 51 in the Nevada desert from January 1971 to 1982. He maintains that for 11.5 years, he never saw the light of day working underground with access beyond the first 15 man-made levels to the deeper 16 to 31 levels allegedly inhabited by an advanced interior Earth civilization. He reported that he made six trips into the hollow earth, encountering the subterrestrials not of human origin. Woodard claims they are 13 to 14 feet in height, are spiritually evolved beings who communicate telepathically and have obviously developed amazing technological capabilities. He also stated that the hollow earth has an inner sun, 
one ocean and one continent larger than the Earth's surface landmass. Billy Fay Woodard says that the Earth's shell, separating the inner and outer worlds, is about 800 to 850 miles in thickness, and that our planet's center of gravity is roughly at this shell's midpoint. Gravity in the inner world is less than one-third the outer worlds, which Billy cited as the main reason why the inner race of people are several feet taller. According to Woodard, this super race lives in harmony with nature and shares a vested interest in the wayward humans living topside to ensure they do not destroy the entire planet. Apparently, this civilization is willing to work with selected humans like Woodard, deployed by Deep State's Black Ops at Area 51 subterranean levels, 85% being military and 15% civilian. While stationed at Area 51, Colonel Woodard explained that one night he had the opportunity to fly a U.S. manufactured military saucer called Sportscraft. Woodard states that using touch control indentations, with his mind alone, he piloted the motion and velocity of the craft capable of making right turns at incredible speeds without incurring any G-force. At the time, Billy said the U.S. had assembled 67 flying saucers through Area 51's Black Projects. The colonel has said the primary reason he resigned from the Air Force was after learning that many missing children who are abducted and trafficked, those spared from being abused sexually and murdered by the pedophile elite, are taken to Area 51 underground levels to be genetically engineered, programmed, and transformed into looking like alien hybrids that will be used to launch a false flag alien invasion of the Earth to enable the global controllers to achieve their one world government. Upon his discharge, Billy has attempted to get access to his military records that would provide credibility to his spectacular claims, but the government has strictly sealed his records. Billy Fay Woodard also corroborates the authenticity of Norwegian fisherman Olaf Jansen's story, The Smoky God, published in 1908. Olaf sailed into the opening near the North Pole in 1829 and wrote of his wondrous experiences inside the earth and his persecuted, tortuous life back on the surface. As a young man, Olaf suffered for telling his story and kept it to himself until befriending a person near the end of his solitary life to share his amazing tale. But is Woodard speaking the truth, or he's only an eccentric man with an incredibly vivid imagination? Well, we don't know. But whether the whole Hollow Earth story is fact or fiction, it's great to imagine there are still hidden civilizations out there in the world. Ancient myths, geological marvels, uncharted territories, and whispers of lost civilizations intertwine, inviting us to question the limits of our knowledge. As we embark on this thrilling journey, let us remain open to the enigma that lies beneath our feet. For within the depths of our planet, the possibility of a hidden world awaits, urging us to uncover its secrets and reimagine the boundaries of our reality. And now, as the Antarctic climate is already changing, a question comes to my mind. Antarctica was once a rainforest, so could it be again? The rise in average global temperatures is altering the continent's ecology. Poa annua, a bluegrass found in temperate cities such as Cape Town, South Africa, and Melbourne, Australia, has been found in Antarctica. Even a Gentoo penguin colony spotted in Antarctica in early 2022 is cause for concern, as these non-ice-loving birds typically live in sub-Antarctic islands and are likely venturing south only because climate change is warming the southernmost continent. Aside from the peninsula, most of the continent is an ice sheet, several kilometers thick in places. Climate modeling predicts a large growth in the ice-free area. But according to Stephen Chown, a professor of biological sciences at Monash University in Australia, at the highest areas where just the mountain peaks stick up, we're unlikely to see anything that changes by, say, 2100. The melting of the Western Antarctic ice sheet and the consequent rise in sea levels will change not just the geography of Antarctica, but the climate of our entire planet. As Julie Brigham Gret, 
professor of quaternary glacial geology and Arctic paleoenvironments at the University of Massachusetts said, most of West Antarctica is below sea level, but rising sea levels would also elevate small rocky islands there rather than totally inundating them. As we lose the ice shelves in the future, one issue will be making sure the settlements are above sea level. Looking past 2100, rising temperatures and sea levels are likely to accelerate the migration of climate refugees. People may seek to colonize the Antarctic if its cooler climate remains more hospitable than hotter parts of the world. Even without growing crops, melting sea ice may mean people will attempt to fish in the area. But despite our attempts to explore and study Earth's harshest, most inhospitable continent, we're unlikely to have Antarcticans anytime soon. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.